So yesterday we talked about um, what fusion is, uh, where it originates, what's the physics, the nuclear physics of what's going on when you try and stick two nuclei together and how that works. Well, to be honest, there's a lot of details that I missed out. Um, today we're going to talk about where we are um, in terms of the experiments to try and make fusion uh, into a commercial power source. Um, so this takes you right up to the edge of research. I'll show you some of the things that I've spent my life thinking about in terms of what are the problems that we are, are looking at. Um, and I will introduce you to some of the ideas we're having about how to make smaller, faster, cheaper fusion devices so that we get to fusion quicker than we're currently predicted to do. Most of the um, current predictions are that we will not be getting fusion power till the second half of this century. And it would be very nice to speed that up by at least 20 years because we really need, increasingly need, um, carbon-free energy sources to deal with uh, global warming. So with that, um, let's move on. Um, by the way, this is a picture of the central library called the Radcliffe Camera at uh, Oxford University where I am now. Um, and if you're a student at Oxford, you actually can get to sit inside this thing and uh, do your studying. Um, it's quite a beautiful structure, really. Just a reminder, okay, what's the, what's the uh, reaction that we want to do? Right. We actually want to do two reactions. Um, and this is a reminder from yesterday, just so we are all caught up. And I'm going to make some points about um, what the international experiment, ITER, is really trying to do. Um, it's very important to understand a little bit about this reaction that I didn't emphasize so much yesterday. Okay, you've got these two isotopes of hydrogen. They both have charge one, of course. They have one proton in the nucleus. Uh, deuterium is heavy hydrogen. It's got one proton and one neutron. And tritium is super heavy hydrogen. It's got one proton and two neutrons. If you ram them together at sufficient speed that you can get away from their electrostatic repulsion and you get close enough that the strong force acts, it will grab, the, they'll grab each other, do a little dance because actually they kind of rearrange their protons and neutrons in that moment into helium-5 and then the helium-5 splits up in 10 to the minus 20 seconds um, into helium and a neutron. Um, the helium comes out with one-fifth of the energy and the neutron comes out with four-fifths. And that's roughly because this happens, these are very, very energetic and so the momentum of that one has to equal the momentum of that one because there's effectively very little momentum in the beginning, even though these are moving super fast, these are moving so incredibly fast that they have huge momenta. So if you have zero momentum, the helium, actually, this picture doesn't really do it right. The helium has to go off in one direction and the neutron in the other direction to conserve momentum. And if they're conserving momentum and one has four times the mass of the other one, um, then, um, uh, then, uh, then this one has one-fifth of the energy and this has four-fifths of the energy. Okay? Do a little calculation and see that zero momentum would give you that. Okay, and the total amount of energy here is 17.6 MeV of energy from this reaction. Of course, in order to do this in a reactor, you're going to have to breed, as we say, your tritium. Your tritium decays in 12.4 years, and you can't keep it around uh, for that long. And so we do that by bombarding lithium with a neutron and helium and tritium and putting that back in our reactor. This happens in the walls of your reactor, in a structure we call the blanket. And for now, we're just going to push that aside, because actually, that's not actually the hard thing to do. This happens at room temperature. You see, a neutron can go and collide with lithium. There's no repulsion. Why no repulsion? No charge, exactly, no charge. 
Ah, you're all so smart. Um, and I'm sleep deprived, so. <laughs> um, lithium-6, um, you, you can actually do uh, the reaction with the, the majority isotope of lithium, which is lithium-7, but it requires energy. This, this reaction actually gives up energy as well. It's an endothermic, oh, sorry, it's an exothermic reaction. Um, so we won't focus on that because this is the difficult one to do. Because you have to get the temperatures, as we were discussing yesterday, of about 250 million degrees, or 200 million degrees, somewhere in that line. Um, we don't push the temperature very, very far up, because as you heat a plasma up, the electrons start to move faster and faster, and when electrons move fast in a magnetic field, they're whizzing around the magnetic field, and they start to radiate like crazy. Um, that uh, synchrotron radiation, as it's called, will start to be a loss of heat from your plasma, and you have to sustain that somehow by pouring heat in to keep your fuel hot. So actually there's a sort of optimum temperature somewhere between 200 and 300 million degrees where um, you don't have too much of that radiation and you have plenty of fusion. So that's sort of the way we choose the operating temperature for the plasma. So this is the reaction. Now, if you're going to contain this thing in a magnetic field, what does the, new, uh, what does the magnetic field do to the neutron? Effectively nothing. It has a small magnetic moment, but it's really deflected very, very little. Uh, but the helium is charged. And if your field is strong enough, it will also contain your helium. So if you have this reaction happen, it releases some helium, and the helium goes charging through the plasma, going around the magnetic field lines like this, bashing in to your deuterium and your tritium, giving up its energy to it. And so, when you make this reaction happen, this is going to leave your magnetic bottle. But this is going to stay inside your magnetic bottle and provide energy to keep your plasma of deuterium and tritium hot. sure why I put this one in because I spent so much time on it yesterday, but just to point out that the reaction rate, this is the rate of reaction, don't worry about the units, um, against temperature here of a deuterium-tritium mixture, right, peaks up here about 200, 300, uh, well the peak is more like 400, 500, but uh, a million degrees. But we work usually in this region round about here is where we tend to work in terms of the temperature of the plasma. And remember that a handy-dandy formula, it's always good to, to know numbers if you're going to be a physicist, right? Just being able to write down abstract expressions ain't good enough. You've got to remember the numbers that go with it. Because, well, for one thing, you can show off to your friends, but um, the other is that actually putting the numbers together tells you if anything you're doing makes sense in terms of you know, is it a big effect, is it a small effect? Um, so a handy-dandy formula like this, very useful if you're doing fusion, because then you can immediately say, oh, uh, well, the fusion power ought to be about this. Okay? And the fusion power in the middle of eta, which we're going to be talking about in a moment, eta, the pressure in the middle of the plasma is about, about seven atmospheres. So P squared is 49, times this, which is about 0.1, so it's about, it's about uh, 4.5 megawatts per meter cube. So every meter cube to the middle of ITER, the big machine we're building in France, is producing about 4.5 megawatts in the middle of the plasma. At the edge of the plasma, it's cool. And it's not producing anything at all. So the number of, roughly the number of meters cubed that are doing that is of order 100, 150 meter cubed inside the plasma is actually doing most of your fusion inside it. So those just remembering from yesterday. Let's get on to magnetic confinement. So how is it that a magnetic field confines a, a charged particle and a plasma? 
Okay? So let's go through a few elementary things. Most of you will have done this in your schoolwork, but let's remember. So the force a magnetic field produces on a particle is given by this formula here. It's the charge times the velocity times the magnetic field. But we write it in this way. Who knows the cross product? Okay? Cross products is an, an, a neat thing you can do with vectors. This is the vector V. So in this picture here, V is upwards there. Right? This is the vector B, which in this picture is going into the, into the uh, board, into the screen. Right? And V cross B is a vector that's perpendicular to both B, V, and B. So for instance, if V were like that, and B were like that, then V cross B, I'm going to have to do my right hand rule now, V cross B would pointing like that, perpendicular to the plane that spans my two arms. Okay? So it's a way of combining two vectors to produce a third one, for every two vectors there is a direction perpendicular to both of them, um, and the magnitude of it is the magnitude of V times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them. Okay? So that's what a cross product is. But now, so if we're going V like that and B in like that, oh, and it obeys the right-hand rule. So you put V, you put your thumb along V, you put your first finger along B, and the force is in the direction of the perpendicular to both of them, and so it points inwards. So what happens, to this, what happens to this charged particle moving up here is there's a force like that. So as it moves, it curves around. But when it's here, V is like that, and when it's here, V is like that. right? So always the force is inwards. And that force provides the force to balance the centripetal acceleration of a particle going around a circle. Did you all do this in school? Okay, you're bored right now. <laughs> so the, the, the period it takes to go around there, right, you can work this out by balancing centripetal uh, acceleration against this force, m times centripetal acceleration, um, will give you the orbital period, which is inversely proportional to the magnetic field. So the stronger the magnetic field, the faster it goes around this circle, but of course the smaller the circle. This is the radius of the circle, which we normally give the symbol rho to. That's the Greek letter rho. There it is, rho. Right. Now, the ions, that's the deuterium and tritium nuclei, have different masses, so they have, a, and this is the velocity, so typical velocity, you can work out from the temperature because the temperature is basically proportional to the kinetic energy. A typical velocity t times the mass, right, um, divided by Q times B. Now, electrons, because they have very low mass, have very, very small circles inside our device. Because we have a field in our device, typically in jet, it's, this is 3 tesla. In ITER, it's going to be 5 tesla. Right? It's a very, very strong magnetic field. And so these circles that it makes around the magnetic field for a deuterium is about a millimeter, and for an electron is um, uh, 1 60th of a millimeter. So these are tiny, tiny little circles around the magnetic field line. But that force, remember the force was V cross B perpendicular. It makes it go a circle around the magnetic field line, but it doesn't stop it going, the charged particle going along the field line. So the charged particle goes along the field line freely. It makes these spirals about the magnetic field line. And some particles right, have a tight spiral, and some of them are almost moving directly along the field line. There's a whole distribution of particles inside the plasma moving around 
at different speeds and the different angles to the velocity with respect to the magnetic field as it's moving along. <coughs> and you have to work all that out to get the, to get the motion. Now, as I said yesterday, if your magnetic field, with its lines in space, if those magnetic field lines actually touch, go straight into the wall, so will the particles. Now, a typical, a typical um, deuterium ion inside a fusion plasma will be moving at about 1,000 kilometers a second. So in a short fraction of a second, it'll go the few meters into the wall. So you actually have to make sure that the magnetic field lines stay inside the device. And typically, well, the, the way we do that is to essentially bend the magnetic field round in a circle. And that's done, as I said yesterday, by taking a solenoid and bending it until the solenoid makes a donut shape. That field that goes around the long way is called the toroidal magnetic field, and that's that green line in the picture. And those would just be circles as you go around. The problem with just circles is it can't hold the pressure of the plasma. Remember, we're going to put the deuterium and tritium inside here, and we're going to heat it up to this incredible temperature, and it's going to have a pressure of, say, seven atmospheres. And if it just had circles going around like that, that field would not hold the pressure. We'll get to that in a second. We've got to have current, electrical current, inside this plasma in order for it to hold the pressure. Because the pressure is going to be pushing out from the middle towards the outside, and we've got to have a force pulling it back in again. And that force is the attraction of the current with itself. We'll get to this in a moment. So we've got another part to this field, the magnetic field inside our device. We've got the field going the long way round that's created by these, sorry, I should be doing it in the middle, shouldn't I? Created by these coils going around here. Those ones in ETA, those coils, produce the field of 5.2 Tesla right here. The field right on the side of the magnet here is 11.8 Tesla. That's a field with a pressure of about, the, the, the magnetic field produces a force that's equivalent to a pressure on the coil, which is about 500 atmospheres of pressure on the coil, which is about half the pressure at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. So these coils have to be made of steel, and they have superconductors inside them, and the superconductors carry, carry the current, and the steel takes up the force from that because the superconductor is a rather brittle and not terribly strong material. And so the coils that it's made of right here have to be these extremely high-tech coils in which you can support... Yeah, I am. Yeah, okay. In which you... <laughs> I thought I just got off. Uh, I'm in such a zone. Um, so the, the, so the, the coils that produce the field around here are external to the plasma. Now, in order to get the plasma to pull itself together, we've got to put this electrical current. And if you put a current going around like that, it'll produce another kind of field. So what's the, what's the field of a, of a wire carrying a current like that look like? Exactly. It has these rings that the magnetic field goes around. So if we have a current going around like this, Right? It's going to produce rings around that current. You can see this green ring right there. That's called the poloidal field. And the total field is the sum of the field produced by that cur those currents in the coils and the current in the plasma, with these red arrows, right? which produces these yellow magnetic field lines that go round the long way and curl round the short way. So it sort of goes around like this, the magnetic field line. Sorry, that makes me dizzy. Really, I shouldn't have had that beer last night. Uh, I didn't actually, I went to bed, but anyway, never mind. Uh, 
Um, so w w now, w what happens to our particles in this field? So the first thing you would do, um, and there's a new device that they've just uh, constructed in Germany, up on the Baltic coast of Germany, in a place called Greifswald, which is like this, except it's three-dimensional. These coils aren't symmetric. And this is called a stellarator, and the device is called Wendelstein 7X, and it costs um, a few billion euro. Um, it's a marvellous piece of engineering, but an absolutely crazy magnetic field, because it looks like this magnetic field, except it's three-dimensional. So it's not a symmetric donut, it's kind of a, a donut that you might have get your fingers on and bent around and squashed, etc. And so it's completely three-dimensional as you go around. And the first question you would ask, are the particles actually going to stay inside this? If I just let a deuterium go inside this magnetic field, what's its orbit? And the fields here, actually, for a field like this, you can solve using ordinary you know, maths on a piece of paper and figure out the orbit here. It's tough, but you, know, you, you could do it. Or maybe you could do it in your first year in university, something like that. Um, but for the three-dimensional field in this new German device, you pretty much have to do it on a computer um, and follow the particle orbits in that. So you have to ask that question because the last thing you want to do is they're moving at 1,000 kilometers per second and it's going to follow this magnetic field line almost. Now, it's not exactly going to have these spirals because the field isn't exactly constant. And so what I showed you, the spiral, is true for a constant magnetic field, but if, you if the magnetic field changes in space, the spiral stays close to the field line, but shifts a little off it. And in fact, what happens in an axisymmetric field is, and I think I showed you this yesterday, just because it's really pretty, these are just calculating on the computer. Um, I, I, I misspoke yesterday. These are actually the orbits of the helium nuclei produced in fusion reactions inside jet. Right? Um, now, the helium nuclei have a lot of energy, and so their spiral is much fatter than the, the, the spiral you would have of deuterium. And so you want to know, will they stay inside? By the way, normally we call a helium nucleus an alpha particle. Right? And so th these are the alpha particles produced by the fusion reactions inside jet. Now, if they don't stay inside jet after they've been produced by the fusion reaction, they won't give up their energy. If they weren't captured by the magnetic field line, by the magnetic field, they won't be able to give up their energy to the deuterium and tritium and heat the plasma. And you won't get any of the self-heating from the plasma. So the first thing you have to ask yourself if you're going to do what we call a burning plasma experiment, where we're going to make fusion happen, and the alpha particles are going to heat the plasma, and the plasma is going to stay hot because fusion is happening inside it, right? is to ask the question, will they stay in there? And for jet, this is quite simple, and you get orbits of the alpha particles that look... Well, they're supposed to look like that. Let's try again. There we go. Now, these are interesting because the spiral... I mean, you can definitely see the spiral, right? It's, it's going around many times here. But these are, as I said before, called banana particles. If they get to a certain point, they reflect and they come back. There it goes, it's reflecting, it's coming back. And actually, a lot of the alpha particles are on these kind of orb orbits inside jet. But they are contained, but you can see that the, the orbit shifts off the plasma a little bit inside here. And if they're born close to the center, they're still shifted away from the center. If jet was a lot smaller, we wouldn't be containing the alpha, well, if it was half the size, we wouldn't really be containing those alpha particles, and we wouldn't be able to get the heat from them. So what, because jet contains them, we're pretty darn sure that ETA, which is twice the size and has a stronger magnetic field, will contain them very nicely. Now, 
Think about it. Those particles inside are moving around at great velocity. That motion at great velocity is exactly what causes pressure. I mean, what's pressure from the air on your hand is just molecules bouncing off your hand. And in this case, right, inside the plasma, we've got very high pressure at the middle of the magnetic bottle and low pressure at the outside. So the pressure is pushing outwards, trying to, trying to go outwards. And we want to push on it with the magnetic field. How does that happen? Well, the force on each particle is this force that I showed you before. It's the charge on each particle times its velocity crossed with the magnetic field. And if I take that charge times velocity, I can write it in terms of the net current inside the plasma. Because it's a moving charge, what, what, what is a current inside a wire? It's, it's positive charges going one way, negative charges going the other way. So you can relate the, the charge times the velocity to the current. And this is the current vector. So it's, it's the direction in which the charge flow is, right? And it's the coulombs per second charge. Now, you can use Ampere's law. Who knows what Ampere's law is? Ampere's law is what tells you what the magnetic field from a current is. So if you have a wire carrying a current, it says that the magnetic field around it goes in circles, and from a, a current of I, you get a magnetic field which is mu naught times I divided by 2 pi R. This mu naught is a constant. How many people have seen that? Good, good. Smart people, okay. So the, the, the current and the magnetic field are related to each other. So if you put the substitute for the current using this formula here, you will see that the total force of the magnetic field on all the particles, I'm summing up every single particle inside the plasma, right? the total force now, we replace the current using the magnetic field, is basically the area on the outside of the of the, of the torus, so that's the area of the surface of the plasma. See the purple surface? Take that area, that area is 2 pi r, which is the distance around there, times 2 pi big r, which is the distance around there. And that's the area of the toroidal surface. Okay, big r is the radius from there to there, little r is the radius of the, the little radius of the donut. We call that the minor radius and that the major radius for obvious reasons. Right. So that area, the total force of the magnetic field on the plasma is that area times the magnetic field squared divided by mu naught. So this is kind of interesting because that looks like a pressure. Pressure is a force per unit area. So force is a pressure times an area. So the magnetic field produces a pressure on the plasma. And the pressure on the plasma that's produced in ITER is many, many atmospheres of pressure. But actually, and we have to be careful here, the pressure on the, on the plasma can be balanced from magnetic pressure inside the plasma and inside the plasma, the pressure due to the plasma itself. But roughly, in order to contain it, you have to have the pressure of the plasma has to be balanced with the magnetic pressure that's pushing on it. So this is how we're holding this thermonuclear plasma. Thermonuclear, because it's doing fusion reactions, the deuterium and tritium, we're pushing on it with the magnetic field from the outside and holding it in place. Unfortunately, this is kind of like holding, you know, that red jelly we, we had for dinner last night. It's like taking the red jelly, wrapping knitting wool around it and trying to hold it in space. Um, it's, it, holding it with these lines, the magnetic field lines that go around it, is a bit like that because unfortunately it's going to ooze out between 
the magnetic field lines in ways that are rather um, uh, difficult to, to um, model. But then, in principle, you're simply pushing on the magnetic field, uh, on the pr uh, plasma with the magnetic field. So let's go to what ETA is going to have to do. This is a computer-aided design engineer's picture of the device that I showed you a, a picture of, uh, ETA. Did I, um, did I include another? Let's see what I've included here. Uh, no, I haven't included. That was that big shiny building in southern France that they're building. Um, ETA is supposed to be finished in 2025. I mean, they're building the device at the moment. The first of the big magnetic coils has been built. That's the first of the coils. These are the coils right here. Somebody asked me yesterday, aren't they, don't they have to be very cold because they're superconductors? Yes, they have to be at 4 degrees Kelvin. So this thing here, this, you see this sort of slightly purpley coloured thing here? That's one of the coils. And that is made of niobium and tin, the, each, each strand of the coil is copper, so you have a normal conductor, and the niobium tin conductor in, wound in a kind of spiral, and then that spiral is wound around other spirals, and then that's set in little troughs in a piece of steel so that the force that's on those wires can be taken up by that. So there's your coil. These yellow stuff is the, is the tiles on the surface inside because inside here, inside this yellow region here, is where the plasma is going to sit. This is the size of a standard European woman, actually, um, right there. Um, and uh, you can see how enormous it is. So these things here are at 4 degrees Kelvin. Somewhere in the middle of the plasma, about there, right, will be about 200... 250 million degrees. And so as we were saying yesterday, probably the biggest temperature gradient you could ever possibly imagine. The idea is that this will produce half a gigawatt, so 500 million watts of fusion power and sustain it for more than 400 seconds. This is what we promised the politicians that we will deliver. Right? You've got to promise them something that you're pretty certain you're going to deliver. It might deliver much more than this, um, but y y y we've got sort of a conservative estimate of what's called the baseline performance. And this power amplification me means that power out to power in has to be greater than 10. I actually think we'll get to ignition, which means that we put no power in at all in this device. And uh, do you all recognize the flag? Those are the people involved in it. I, I won't give you a quiz on the flags. I'm sure you all know you're all so smart. Um, so that's what the device actually looks like. Um, when it's making 500 megawatts of fusion power, one-fifth of the power is the power in the alpha particles, in the helium. Right? I'm going to call the helium alpha particles, as we do in physics. So 100 megawatts of power, of fusion power, in the alpha particles. If we got it to burn, that's what would happen. So now I've coloured in where the plasma is going to go in pink right here, and the alpha particles are depositing their power somewhere in the middle of the plasma, and the neutrons are escaping into the wall. And in the wall of this device, we will have six, what we call, blanket modules, testing out how to breathe the tritium from lithium in the walls. And the, the, each the, of those is one of the partners gets to try out their engineering on it. So each of the partners... There are seven partners, and one of them, the United States, has decided not to make a blanket module. But all the other partners are making blanket modules to stick in the, in, in the things. So there'll be 400 megawatts of neutron power going into the wall. We will be breeding tritium, but not making electricity. Um, because this experiment will be switched on, switched off, switched on, switched off. And nobody wants to buy electricity from somebody who keeps switching it on and off. Um, so there's no attempt to actually make electricity from all the heat that's coming out of this. In principle, when you actually make a commercial reactor, that those walls here, the walls of, of ITER, 
will go up to maybe uh, 400, 500 degrees centigrade. And uh, normally what you would do is you put a coolant through the wall and you would use it to boil water and power a steam turbine. So this is the world's most expensive steam engine. Now here's where we get to the energy balance. So here's, here's my plasma sitting inside here. And it's producing all this fusion power. One-fifth of the fusion power is going to heat the plasma because that's the alpha particle. I can inject heat from the outside, and I'll tell you how I'm going to do that in a moment, which eats, and that has to be balanced by the losses, by the fact that the magnetic bottle isn't perfect. The magnetic bottle allows some of the particles to leak out, and every time a particle leaks out of the magnetic bottle and strikes the wall, I lose energy from my plasma. And typically, the particles stay a few seconds inside the, inside the plasma. Um, in ETA, we want them to stay about three or four seconds inside. That's called the energy confinement time. And the way they get out is due to the fact that it's bubbling and there's turbulence inside there. So the way we characterize the loss of heat is in terms of a time, tau E. Tau is just the Greek T, basically, and E just means energy. Um, and this number we measure in experiments. We can now calculate that number on big supercomputers, and I'll show you some of the calculations in a moment, and this is what I've spent most of my life trying to do, is to calculate these numbers here for, um, for the experiments and be able to predict how fast the energy goes out. So in order to sustain the plasma, we've got to have the self-heating plus the external heating balance that loss. And so this is the loss of energy from the plasma has to be balanced by those two. Now, how do I heat the plasma? It's not very easy to figure out how you heat something to these immense temperatures. The first way we heat the plasma is we pass the current through the plasma. In ITER, that will be 15 million amps of electrical current going around the, around the loop. You've got the deuterium and tritium going one way and the electrons going the other way. Every time they bump into each other and collide, electrons obviously don't fuse, they just bounce off, but they exchange momentum. And so their directed motion, like this, gets randomized because they bump into each other and they deflect it off at an angle like that. And that means that the directed motion in the current gets converted into random motion, which is heat. Right? And so by passing 15 million amps through it, you can heat it up. But unfortunately, the hotter it gets, the less it collides. So you can heat it up to about, um, a, about 20 million degrees, quite effectively, with just the electrical current. But you haven't got it up to the thermonuclear temperatures necessary for fusion to go. So you've got to have another way of heating it. And ITER has two different ways of doing that. One of them is we use accelerators. So we have an accelerator that accelerates a deuterium ion. It's a positive ion, and you accelerate it in an electric field, in, over a voltage, up to an energy like one megavolt. So much larger than you need. But you can't get it into the plasma because there's a magnetic field. And it try to go into the plasma, it'll come right back out again. It'll just curve around and come back out again. So what you've got to do is, once you've accelerated it as a charged particle, so you've got to pass it through a tube of gas. And as it goes through the tube of gas, sometimes an electron will hop on and make an atom. And when it does, you've got a neutral particle, because an atom has a positive charge and a negative charge in it and then it will cross the magnetic field. So these are called neutral beams. Right? And so it's an accelerator plus a neutralizer makes a beam of neutral particles. And if you look in this picture here, this is exactly what's happening here. You have these great big beams of particles, and on, on JET we have up to 30 million watts in our neutral beams that send in these very energetic neutral 
atoms into the center of the plasma. When they get to the center of the plasma, the electron gets knocked off, and suddenly you've got two charged particles and they're trapped by the magnetic field. So if you can just adjust the energy of the beam just right, it gets from the edge to the middle before the electron gets knocked off, and then it's captured and it deposits its energy right in the middle of the plasma. And that's how we heat them. Those on ITER will be something about 50 million watts worth of neutralized beams in order to heat up the plasma. The second one we have is we have, um, we have some antenna on the wall and we beam in radio waves that are absorbed by the plasma. And I, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that right now. So, in order to understand what's happening inside the plasma, we've got to understand how fast the heat loses from the plasma. How fast do we lose the heat from the plasma and how much energy we put in with our beams. And we have these great big computer codes that do this and we can simulate what we think is going to happen in that, in that experiment. So what I'm going to show you now is a simulation by a friend of mine called Bob Budney who's at Princeton in the United States. Um, and it's, it, it's a simulation that's been validated against the results in JET um, over a period about 2008 to 2013. Um, so those, these are theoretical models that put together all the processes that are going on so you can actually simulate how the experiment will operate. And obviously it's very complicated, so I'm not going to go into the details exactly of that, but you can understand, uh, you can understand the effect. Okay, what you're plotting in here, along the bottom, is time. And zero is when you put in your deuterium and tritium as a gas into that great yellow space inside ether. Inside that yellow space, already the magnetic field is on. The superconducting magnets never go off. You just leave them on all the time. It doesn't cost you anything except the energy to keep cooling the magnet down to 4 degrees Kelvin. And they're well insulated, so the energy cost in cooling the magnets is 10 to 20 megawatts of power, and for ITER that's a small amount of power, so we just keep doing it all the time. Right. So those superconducting magnets are on, and at, at time t equals zero, you inject a gas of deuterium and tritium inside. Then what you do, let's go back to the picture. I forgot to emphasize this. Then what you do at that point is you see this coil going down the middle here. This coil here you put a current through that coil. And what that does is change the magnetic flux that goes right through the center. And if you change magnetic flux, what do you get according to Faraday's law? An EMF, right? Electromagnetic force. And that voltage goes round the loop here. What that does, that voltage, is it's enough to cause the electrons to be ripped off the deuterium and the tritium and then form a plasma. So just like in a fluorescent light bulb, you form a plasma inside a fluorescent light bulb, you've now formed a plasma. Not only have you formed a plasma, but because there's a voltage going round, it's going to drive an electrical current round the loop. So you change the flux through the middle and suddenly you're driving the current round the loop. During that time, you ramp up in, a, in a, a few seconds. You ramp up to about 15 million amps of current. That's here. Now what you're plotting up this side is fusion power out. And at this time in your simulation, right, there's no fusion power. Between zero and the beginning of this blob here, the plasma temperature is about 20 million degrees. So you don't see any fusion power at all. It's hot by our standards, but it's not hot enough for fusion to actually take place. 
Then at this point here, at about 80 seconds in to operations, you turn on those massive, big accelerators to produce the neutral beams. And they start bombarding the plasma with these very energetic particles that start to heat it up. This is your match. This is going to light the plasma because the heat from those beams causes the central temperature to rise and I'm going to follow scan two. D different scans in here are different scenarios. I'll explain in a moment the different scenarios. But scan two is the one based on the most trusted models at the moment. Okay, all of this is evolving science. So the models that we, we use to model it are evolving every year. And they get better, we hope, every year. <laughs> we think they get better. Um, so at this point, you put on 70 megawatts of heating power. And the central temperature goes up, and you see the blue line goes up here, and you start to produce 500, 600 megawatts. These are megawatts up here. Sorry, I've cut it off on the edge. That's 400, 600, 800. This is 500 right here. Just above 500 to 600 megawatts of heating power. Then we, at this point here, we step down the heating power. Sorry, this is fusion power. Step down the heating power to 50 megawatts. So this is what we're heating with. This is our match. We're applying this energy from outside. The plasma temperatures come up. And the fusion power has started to happen. Now, if, this, if we have this much fusion power, one-fifth of it is heating the plasma. So two things are heat heating the plasma now. There's the external heat, which is coming from those beams, and the heat from the fusion itself, which is coming from the alpha particles produced in the, in the fusion. Right? And that's over 100 megawatts of alpha particle heating. So actually the heat we're producing from the outside is, is less than its self-heating. And then at this point here, at 400 seconds in, we turn off the beams. You take the match away. And look at scan two. It keeps going. At this point, this is a burning plasma. The simulation suggests that if we, if we run this scenario inside the machine, and at 400 seconds we turn off our external beams, the self-heating from the fusion itself will sustain the heat inside the plasma, and it will just burn. So there you've lit your fire. It's a light at that point. Now, you might ask the question, isn't it going to run out of deuterium and tritium? Yeah, it will. If, if in a few seconds, we will start to run out of the deuterium and tritium to burn um, in, inside our plasma because we'll be using it up. We've only got 0.1 of a gram of deuterium and tritium inside that whole big yellow donut-shaped hole. But what we do is we keep firing in, this is like putting more logs on the fire, keep firing in frozen pellets of deuterium and tritium into the plasma. They cross from the edge of the plasma into the middle, and as they're going in, they're evaporating because they've been bombarded by the plasma. The plasma is hugely hot, and that frozen pellet has to move extremely fast to get, get in very far. Typically, the pellets will only go 20 to 30 centimeters into the plasma. And that's the way we keep feeding deuterium tritium into the system for it to heat up to these temperatures and to burn and to make fusion power. Um, so we have to consistently keep doing that. And it's leaking heat all the time, but the heat that's being leaked out is being replaced by the fusion power inside, inside the experiment itself. If ETA does this, that will be the moment everybody talks about is the moment we actually did fusion. Right. The fusion that we've done on jet is fusion because we we kept the beams on. The moment we turn the beams off on jet, it just goes out. All right. When you turn the beams off on ETA, we think it will sustain. Now it's an experiment. <laughs> you know, ex experiments. Um, this is a very complicated system, and un unlike you know a simple physics problem of a few particles our theory and our ability to predict is relatively crude. And it's theoreticians like me that are trying to advance those models. So what we did in order to look at what would happen if some of our assumptions weren't quite right is we took different models. 
Scan 4 is very interesting, right? If scan 4 happens, it's a bit of a disaster. We'll be a bit embarrassed if it's scan 4. You know what happened in scan 4? We have to model, we keep producing helium, right? Those alpha particles. And they accumulate inside the plasma. And if the plasma becomes more helium than it becomes deuterium and tritium, it will, it will stop having fusion reactions because you can't have a fusion reaction between helium and helium. There just aren't any fusion reactions that happen really between helium and helium. It's a long story, but I won't go into it. So helium is what we call the ash because just like when you have a burning fire, you're left with this ash. And if you don't get rid of the ash at the bottom of your fire, eventually it'll just be a pile of ash and you won't have any fuel. And the same thing happens if the helium accumulates. Now, what we observed on jet was that the helium does get flushed out by the turbulence. And we have a model of how it gets flushed out. But we only have a little bit of data that says that it gets flushed out. And so what we did here is, in the modeling of ETA, we turned off the flushing of the helium. And what happens is, yeah, we get a burst of fusion power, but then the helium builds up, and the fusion power drops and drops and drops and drops. And when it gets to this point, the fusion power, the, um, the, the helium, there's no fusion happening essentially, and it goes out. If scan 4 happens, that will be a big disaster. But we've been actually figuring out how we can enhance the way the helium is flushed out of the system, the way of getting rid of the, the ash from the system. The other, other scans you will see different assumptions in, and I'm not going to describe them, etc. So, this is the only experiment in which theory has ever predicted we would get to the fusion burn that we want. People have made many, many fusion experiments around the world, but none of them have actually had a theoretical prediction that they would get to a fusion burn. Not even the National Ignition Facility um, in uh, California, which is the laser experiment. So, at least we're in, in a situation where we're building a device in which we expect to see fusion actually happen. And as I said, we, we, the first time the device will operate is about 2025. Um, you think that's a long way away. I think it's really close. <laughs> and around 2030, it will be getting to these full power um, operation like this. Um, the key thing in there, so I, I showed you the best model that we know. But inside that model is a model of how the heat gets from the middle to the outside, inside the device. And the modeling of that is based on probably state-of-the-art theoretical physics that we're not, we're, we're in the process of really understanding. This is a calculation of how the turbulence works inside the device. This took three months on what was then, some years ago actually, this, this, is, from about, um, this is from about six years ago. This is a computer calculation. This is not data, but it's, from a, I mean, it's data from the computer. It's not from, from an experiment. And what you can see here is the model of the turbulent density fluctuations of the plasma inside. So what's happening inside the plasma is actually sound waves are rattling around inside. Plasmas do support sound. And when sound waves go across a plasma that has this big temperature gradient, right, they become unstable. So what happens inside the plasma is you've got these unstable sound waves and they cause little turbulent swirls. And the turbulent swirls go along these lines of constant color, like that. What you will also see is that they're elongated. These lines here trace out basically the magnetic field lines inside there. This calculation followed 20 billion deuterium and 20 billion tritium and 40 billion electrons inside the device to model what would happen inside the plasma. This calculation is modeling all the interactions between all those particles 
and all the electric fields and the magnetic fields that are made by those particles to get this turbulent activity. What you can also see is it rotates. So this is a self-consistent simulation of what's happening. I'm, I'm going to play it one more time. It's a bit like watching one of those lava lamps. If you, ever this. <laughs> you put it on, have too many beers, and you feel great. <laughs> So we actually start the simulation. Um, I, I, I'm not actually a computer theorist. I, I, I do the pencil and paper work that sets up the equations and solves the analytic equations behind all these simulations. So my group that I had before I became a, you know, head of a large laboratory, the group that I had had simulation people inside it, and I did the calculations that sort of set up those simulations. And the, the, the equations behind this are a set of equations called the gyrokinetic equations. And they're equations that don't actually follow the particles, but follow the rings made of charge made by a particle averaging over the field line and going around the field line. Um, so it's a very complicated set of equations, but it allows us to solve on the computer. Now you see this thing, it looks like it's, um, it looks like it's rotating like this. But actually, it's rotating like this, and it's a barber pole type effect. Um, the plasma in the middle is spinning around, and it's not spinning at the edge. And we take away the mean flow in this picture, and you're seeing the differential flow. So the inside flowing in one direction and the outside flowing in the other direction. Now, this actually turns out to help us a lot. And it's a big clue to how we might make things better. This bubbling of the turbulence takes the hot stuff in the middle outwards and the cold stuff from the outside inward. And this is cooling our plasma and it's stopping the fusion working very well. So if we could get rid of this turbulence, it turns out we could make fusion happen in a device that's only this far across. That would be really nice. Um, so a turbulent-free plasma has never been produced. But if we could do it, it would be very nice. What we have seen in our experiments and now in the, in the theory is that if we rotate it and we differentially rotate it, we suppress some of the turbulence. And by getting that differential rotation just right, we can reduce the amount of heat loss from our plasma and get closer to fusion in smaller devices. So this was a big hint around about the middle of the 90s and around 2000 from, the, from JET and other experiments that we were going to be able to calculate and, and we're going to be able to suppress the turbulence more and get better fusion performance if we spun the plasma around. So how do we spin the plasma around? Well, those beams that come in, instead of putting them straight into the plasma, if we put them tangential, they can actually not only give you energy in the plasma, they'll give you momentum, an angular momentum. So if we can spin the middle of the plasma but not the edge, we can enhance this effect of being able to comb out the turbulence and produce these little patches here. You can see this patch around here. Sorry, I should do it in the middle here. This patch here, there's almost no turbulence in that patch. If we could make that happen throughout the plasma, that would be terrific. Got about an hour, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. I think what I'll do is I'll skip these two slides. Is two. This is the, um, the, the question is, how much do we trust that model that ETA will work? Um, and part of that has come out of these experiments from JET. Again, this picture I showed you yesterday is the inside of JET. And by the way, I'm about that tall. From about there to there. From about there to there. So it's about twice as tall as me inside. So this is not, this is not tiny. This is huge, right, inside there. Um, the experiments in JET started in 1983. And gradually, we changed JET and adapted JET in order to make it perform better and better. And I showed you yesterday that we managed to make some fusion happen in the 1990s. This was this graph here. This was the American device at Princeton, TFDR, in 1994, got to 10 megawatts of fusion power. 
This is jet getting to 16 megawatts of fusion power. And as I emphasized yesterday, this is probably the model type we want to know, which is you bring out the fusion power, you hold it steady, and then you bring it back down again. Um, we've just bought um, another chunk of tritium. Well, it's not a chunk, it's in liquefied form. Um, uh, of tritium, uh, we paid, as I told you yesterday, 30,000 a gram for the tritium to come from Canada, where it's made in the Canadian reactors. Um, and uh, we're going to do, we're going to try and beat our world record, which is this one, by, in 2018, taking it up to 15 to 20 megawatts, this is the error bar on our prediction, holding it and bringing it back down again. Um, so, we're not waiting for 2030, we're going to try and do some experiments in the intervening time that would, that would make this happen. Um, if that does, that will help us validate the model and say that the theoretical model in which we're predicting the future is sort of right. Um, if it doesn't happen, I won't be talking to you again. One of the reasons I was happy to talk to you guys is that I think these experiments are very, very important. They're going to make us do fusion for the first time, and it's a bit like, as I said yesterday, the Wright brothers getting off the ground, flying a plane round in a circle, and landing again. It wasn't getting people across the, you know, the Atlantic or you know, from one side of the country to the other, but it was the first step you needed to do to show that you could actually make flight possible. And in that sense, ITER is an enormously important experiment and just bloody good fun, actually. I mean, if we actually made it burn, that would be just fantastic. But I think to be able to make commercial fusion power, the expense of making these very, very big, very, very expensive devices is going to make it hard for it to compete in, any, in the energy market. What we need is simpler devices that work better at smaller size and at smaller cost. And theoretically, if you can get rid of the turbulence, you can bring the size of an actual device that would make fusion to be able to sit roughly on this table. That's a lot, lot smaller than the experiments we're doing at the moment. And so I don't think we have all the right ideas. And one of the things... I've been doing, and what's mostly what I do now in terms of my research, is to try and look at how the ways in which we could bring the cost and scale of these devices down. But it's probably true that all the good ideas have not been had, and certainly not by me, um, and that your generation is going to have to take up the challenge, not of doing fusion, but doing commercial fusion, bringing down the cost so it was capable of actually delivering to the market something that we need. I think you know that the long-term future of energy is very, very uncertain. And maybe, you know, solar power plus storage will actually make, make us completely safe. But I think it will be very, very advantageous if we develop fusion as a commercial option. And to do that, you've got to have ideas. I'm sure that we're missing something. And if you have a really smart idea, give me a call and I'll share it with you. I just want to grab your idea, that's all. What we've been doing, so this idea that if we spin the plasma, we can get rid of the turbulence. When we've done the calculations of this, it looks like there might be a sweet spot. Let me just um, move forward to that and I'll, I'll show you. What we did, this is a, a student at, at Oxford, the, all these guys, uh, these three guys, him, him, him and myself all teach at Oxford. Uh, this is a guy at Cullum and this was a student, Edmund Hycock, um, who uh, now is in Sweden um, as a University of, in Sweden. Um, and what we were showing is that this is the turbulent heat coming out of the device. And this is basically rotation along here. 
And what he was showing is if we get the sweet spot in the rotation, roughly around here, then there's no turbulent loss of heat. And we don't think we've actually hit that sweet spot yet. And that if we could actually adjust the rotation just right inside the plasma, we might get to a point where the plasma just contains the heat perfectly. And that we don't get this turbulent bubbling of the plasma and the loss of heat. And this, his calculation, was done for a, um, what we call a spherical tokamak. It's like the big donut, except that what we've done is we've shrunk the, the hole in the middle out of it and made a much smaller device. And so the device you're going to be looking at, the plasma you're going to be looking at in a moment, is about, roughly about as tall as me, um, but in a very much more contained, smaller device with a weaker magnetic field. Um, and here's the um, picture of it actually working. Um, this is called MAS, the mega amp, so it's got a million amps going through it, uh, spherical tokamak, at Cullum, which is my old laboratory. This is the plasma going in real time. You can see it flashing there. Um, there's the plasma forming. We got the rotation just about right, and when the rotation's about right, you see the edge of the plasma, so it's flashing and bubbling and stuff at the moment. But look at that. See how the edge of the plasma is well formed, at that time. This, by the way, is where we're injecting fresh deuterium through a valve right here. So you can see it light up. You don't see the hot plasma because hot plasma has no atoms in it. It has free electrons and free ions and it doesn't radiate very much. What you see only is the edge of the plasma, right? And the edge of the plasma is here. This is the hole through the middle in which a rod goes up, right? It's a torus, so it goes around behind that, like that. It's, it's repeating over and over again. What you will see every now and again is little eruptions from the surface. These are the equivalent of solar flares erupting from the surface of the plasma. Now that plasma is going up to about 30 million degrees. It's one hundredth the size of the plasma inside jet. Um, and it's getting, mm, you know, about a quarter of the performance of jet. So about five years, six years ago, I went to the British government and said, look, we're getting these results. It looks like if we go up a little bit in scale, what we'll be able to do is be able to produce the same kind of performance as jet, but in a device that's about this size. If we can just get the spin, get the spin right and strengthen the magnetic field in this by a bit, we should be able to get up to jet performance in a much, much smaller device. And I said, give me some money. And so they gave me, well, actually they gave me 35 million and actually it's cost nearly 45 million, but uh, we, we, we got a little bit more out of them. Um, and, we've, and we've started, and, and we're just finishing, um, we're pumping down, we've got the machine ready, we haven't made a plasma in it yet, uh, here we go. This was us constructing the device. You can see how amazingly fast British people work. Um, anyway. There we go. This is uh, obviously not everything, but this was us um, taking apart the old device, which you saw the, saw the pictures of. That's taking the lid off it, um, taking out that middle column from it. That's the centre column. Um, it doesn't light up. We, we, we put that on the video. Those are the coils coming out. Um, the coils in this is a copper because superconductor costs too much money. You can't, for, for 40 million, you can't put superconductors in there. Uh, that was the device coming out. We're rebuilding the bottom of it here to make this new exhaust system that goes on it. Here it comes out. Um, that's inside it. Um, we, we pulled it apart and we worked on various bits of it in, in various spots there. Um, there are about, uh, uh, about 100 people working on the construction here. Some of them are students, um, a lot of apprentices. Um, and, um, and this is the cassette of the new coils coming in at the top there. Um, this is uh, assembling it about um, nine months ago. It, it, it took about three and a half, four years for me to persuade the government to give us the money. Um, full construction started about two and a half, three years ago. 
Um, and this is uh, just before we closed up the lid on the top, um, looking down in inside the device. Um, this device starts up this year. I think if we can show that we can get um, fusion -like, jet-like conditions in this device, we're not, we're not allowed to put tritium in this device because tritium is a radioactive gas because it decays. Um, putting tritium in this would increase the cost. So what we want to do with this device is show that we can get fusion conditions, but we won't actually do fusion in, inside it. If we, get, if we do that, then there's a, a, a plan, because um, Princeton has built a device almost like it because they like our, our results. Um, there's a plan that maybe the US would build an actual fusion device along these principles, maybe at Oak Ridge National Lab, and that would take probably 10, 15 years to, to construct because it'd be a nuclear device because it actually will do fusion. Uh, during that time. So it's my hope that we have an idea here that will bring down the cost and scale of fusion. But if I'd been talking maybe a year from now, I might actually have some results to show you, but it's just, just been finished. This is the plans. This is the Chinese um, plan for, to build an actual electricity producing reactor. It's called CFETR, uh, the Chinese demonstration reactor. This would come online towards the end of the 2030s and be producing electricity rather than just fusion. Uh, this is it like ITER. It's big, it's going to be expensive, and maybe we'll build reactors like that. And this is the Korean, um, the, the Korean device which would uh, be doing the same thing. This is the European one based on that. My view personally is that before we go to actually build an electricity producing device, We've got to have some ideas that will bring down the cost and scale. These things are phenomenally large. They may cost us 25, 30 billion a pot to build. Um, and I think that that's too expensive and we need more ideas, ideas from people like you. Thank you very much.